speakers. It's the first time we've had four on one uh, session. So let me just say that I'm Patty Williams and I'm a member of the Charter for Compassion Social Justice Team and also a member of Compassion Fayetteville. I will be serving as a host for the meeting this morning. Um, we are providing this session to all of you who are with us uh, with the purpose of hearing from firsthand from four community leaders who are working for systemic and systematic change in the integration of immigrants. And this whole thing is a part of a webinar series that is focusing on challenges both with immigrants and with refugees. But today, this is immigration. Let me just give us an overview of our hour and a half together. I will be introducing uh, Blanca Estevez, Maria Wright, Fernando Garcia, and Magali Likali in a few minutes in more, more depth. So what we will do the first hour is hear one by one from each of the four. Then we will entertain questions from all of you who are participating. The way you can register your questions is if you look at the bottom of your screen, we'll see there is a Q&A. So if you click on that, you can um, write your question and you can do that. There's another way too, that with the question and answer, only the speakers hear and see or read that question. If you enter it into the chat box, which you see at the bottom, the orange box, then all of us can see your question. Please uh, designate if you want your question directed to one of the four or if you want it directed to all. At the end of the four speakers, I will have looked over the questions and try to group them in some kind of thematic format and I will pose the questions to the appropriate person or to all. So that covers our hour and a half in the process. Um, I would also like you to know that all participants are muted and there is no video, so we can't see everybody. We will see each of the speakers one by one. So I think we're ready to get started. Um, let me start by saying all four of our presenters have been involved all of their lives, both personally and professionally, in addressing challenges of immigration. And you'll see how that is in their introductions. Currently, they are truly on the front lines in Arkansas. And on those front lines, they are using their commitment their leadership, their activism, and their advocacy day in and day out. So I think we will hear from some very committed individuals. I'd like to start and introduce you to Magali. Magali. <laughs> Magali, born in Mexico, is the executive director of the Northwest Arkansas Workers Justice Center. That center seeks to organize immigrant and low income workers. And let me just say, all those workers live below the federal poverty line. The center works to organize workers for better wages, benefits, and workplace dignity, as well as to advocate against workplace injustices. I would also like to point out that she was the co-founder of an organization called Industrial Workers of the World. Magali. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for this invitation. It's always a pleasure to share the work that we do with the rest of the people who are not familiar with the context and where we live. And I will just want to start a little bit of talking a little bit more of what we do here at the Worker Justice Center, as you described, Patty. 
uh, we seek justice for for immigrants in their workplace. So the organization started back in 2005 as an official nonprofit, and we've been doing a lot of uh, services like uh, wage theft, um, uh, workers' comp, and so on. But ever since we started, we had a lot of people uh, with the poultry industry facing injustices. So in 2013, we started with the poultry campaign and collecting data about the, the, the working conditions of poultry workers. So the center did an amazing job of, uh, of collecting 500 interviews with, uh, with poultry workers across the state. And in 2016, we finally released this report that it's called Wages and Working Conditions of um, in Arkansas Poultry Plants. And it's a very complex uh, uh, report and where workers talk about the, the wages, the, the line speed, and all of that. So if you have a chance to read our report, it's in our website and nwawjc.org. Uh, and also uh, last year, uh, whenever we released this report, we started doing more the mobilizing phase of the campaign. So back in 2016 in February, for the first time in history, poultry workers in Arkansas stood up to demand better working conditions in, in poultry in the, in the processing plants. So that was a huge thing because poultry workers are so afraid to speak up and that was a huge risk uh, for them to go and stand up uh, outside the Tyson shareholders meeting. Tyson is one of the biggest poultry industries in the, in the, uh, in the, in the country and they are home based in Arkansas. So it was a huge challenge for the organization and for the workers to do this. Eventually in the same year, we were working with other reports about the bathroom breaks because poultry workers are not allowed to go to the bathroom as often. And so a lot of them have to uh, wear diapers or urinate on themselves because they are not allowed to go to the bathroom. So in May, we released this report with Oxfam. It's called No Relief and talks about the, the bathroom break uh, issues. And so we did another rally outside the Tyson's uh, home office and it was also a huge thing because we delivered more than 150,000 petitions to Tyson. And because of the, the issue was so big and so um, shocking for people, we got a lot of media coverage and a lot of attention. So that made Tyson do some changes uh, that we, that eventually this year they come up trying to, to make an agreement to see how they can improve their working conditions. Because, and so th then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the, the challenges that we have in, around that. Whenever the, the, the rally happened last year twice, uh, we didn't have so much support locally. And that's why, because Tyson uh, provides uh, money or gives money to a lot of nonprofits, to churches, to the university, to uh, they help to build parks, highways, uh, anyway, everything that you can name it. I mean, we have roads on Tyson, uh, Don Tyson Parkways. And so the pressure of the corporate pressure in the state of Arkansas, it's a huge problem for us working, trying to work to improve in the working conditions for immigrant workers. So we didn't have uh, locally support from other organizations because of their in, uh, of the conflict of interest uh, because they, of, of course, they are tied with these corporations. So I also wanna point out that Walmart is also based here uh, in Arkansas. So the same happens, uh, the same, Think that they provide money to the university, to nonprofits, to churches. So that way, I mean, even though, yes, we, uh, like Tyson, for instance, last year after the second rally, they donated $15 million to um, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, hospital for children. Of course, we need those type of things here in Arkansas. We need to, we need those hospitals here. But that was because of the of of the exposure of how they treat the workers. So it's a kind of uh, think of how they control the community, uh, because after that, I mean, of course, the community will see like how wonderful Tyson is, how wonderful Walmart is, but they don't see behind what is going on and how they treat the workers. So the organization often face because here in the South, we lived in a right to work state and still a lot of people believe in slavery. And that is reflected in the labor laws that we have uh, in Arkansas. So it is really uh, a challenge for us to talk about the, the working conditions because often we are, we are marked as radicals, we are seen as communists and socialists and all this idea that the community has, has around that concept of seeking uh, better working conditions for workers and plus immigrant workers, it's a huge thing. Also, Marshallese face the same type of issues because and they are even worse marginalized because their their uh, language is not, no, not everything is translated to the language. So it, they also have the same difficulties. Uh, the poultry industries often are based on rural areas and where workers are locked into these jobs. And actually in Arkansas, the immigration started moving here to Arkansas because of the poultry industry. A lot of, uh, Tyson did a lot of uh, illegally, they brought workers illegally to work here. And eventually a lot of people also from California moved to Arkansas because of the, of the, of the opportunities to work in these places. And it was, uh, and it was, um, for them, it was a good opportunity because, for instance, in California, the housing is very expensive. They had to share uh, an apartment with a lot of people, but here they had a more opportunity to have a house. And so they started bringing more of their families and the poultry companies will give them money to actually bring their families or friends to work in the poultry industry. So. Uh, the challenges that we have around that are, are, are huge because of the of the of the idea of, of what it is to to work or to seek justice for for workers. Uh, one of the other things that uh, challenge that we have around that is that uh, I mean in the south is is nothing new that it's so hard to organize it, it, it's nothing new I mean, I mean it, it was it was the same when the other administrations were in is like now with Trump of course it makes it more harder um, even harder because of people are more openly racist openly hateful and so of course we are uh, seeing that it's harder, but it's nothing like it wasn't it wasn't better before either, especially in the state of Arkansas, because as I said, it's a right to work state, but also it's a corporate control state. So those things makes it really hard for uh, types of organizations because we are the only organization of this nature in the whole state of Arkansas that seeks justice for immigrant workers. And so we are often left out of the picture because as I said, we are seen as radicals and communists and all of these terrible things, but we want to change the narratives. We want to change the narratives because now people are I know that a lot of people are so aware or, or the conditions of uh, how they kill the animals in this type of industries. A lot of people are concerned about the environment issues that the poultry uh, companies uh, make in this, and, and especially in the state of Arkansas. So we are about to launch another campaign that is called the good food purchasing policy and where people are going to be able to connect the dots because this is part of a, of an issue of the of the food system uh, workers need to work faster like now the line speed is uh, they have to process 45 chickens per minute 
and they want to keep increasing it because that means more profits. And so that means that the workers are, are going to be uh, are going to be uh, at risk of higher uh, injuries and also are not going to be able to go to the bathroom because we want to think about the line speed and the and the number of chickens means how much production they miss. So it's just like the mass production. So it keeps growing. It keeps increasing every year. And of course, uh, the issues are going to be higher and we cannot sustain this system anymore. And it's not only in the poultry industry, but also in the beef industry, in the por pork industry. All of these uh, industries have the same issues with the workers and the animals and the environment and the nutrition or what we eat out of that, right? Because we are eating uh, the, the animal that is forced to grow faster. We are eating the stress that the workers have to put into processing this, these animals for us to, to eat it and, 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 and enjoy it. But we need to be, see the bigger pictures and where we connect these things as an issue of, uh, of this, uh, uh, of food system. So this uh, new campaign that we are about to launch, uh, we are hoping that a lot of the people who are working towards environment issues or animal welfare or nutrition came to realize that they cannot left a lot outside the labor part of that. So we are hoping that with this, people are going to be more aware that also how workers are treated affects what we eat, affects the environment, affects how the animals are raised. And so, and so yeah, so we are hoping that this campaign will bring us more allies because uh, as I said, uh, one of the challenges that we have is that not at all, a lot of uh, nonprofits will uh, support the work that we do because they receive money from corporations and they don't want to risk that. And of course they need the money and I'm not saying it's bad, but also compromises justice in the in the in this community, especially for immigrants or black communities, it compromises that. So we need like this organization, our our worker justice center doesn't receive money from corporations, and we are very careful where where the money comes from. So we often are very uh, tight in money. Um, and, and, and also, as, as many of you know, in the South, not many foundations give money to, to, to organizations in the South. Now, with Trump administration, things are changing a little bit because people are starting to see that they need to support more organizations in the South. Uh, but as I said, we are very careful of the money that we take because we cannot, because one of the things very important for us is that the workers feel that immigrant workers feel safe and that they feel uh, they have this safe space for the express and express their concerns and they can and they can uh, we can work on their leadership so they can stand up so if the I mean the immigrants are not uh, are not uh, are not stupid they know and whenever they they know that our organization is for them it's uh, it's to create a safe space for them they feel comfortable and we actually have uh i mean we have a, a base of workers here who are fighting in two different in two different committees organizing now we uh we created this uh, salvadorian committee and so we are creating the, the Monet in Missouri because a lot of poultry workers live there and they didn't have any, any help whatsoever. They didn't know, even, they didn't even know what OSHA was. So we went there to train them on this and to create these committees for them to fight because we are a grassroots organized organization. So for us, it's very important that the workers develop the leadership, that the workers are the ones that move their campaigns. The workers are the ones that own the process of, of the campaigns and everything. For, for us, that's very important. So along with that, it's a lot of challenges because yeah. how do you empower an immigrant who is so afraid to speak up in a community that doesn't really welcome their concerns because they don't want to hear. 
And so it's a lot of challenges for us to, 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 to see how we can empower their voices. So we use a lot of, we started to, to use more of the popular education. And also since I, I have a theater background and I was an actress for so many years, I am also teaching them to uh, voice classes and to articulate their sentences, to, to speak up, to be able to, 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 to share their story. And so that is just a process that is slower. Of course, people, when, whenever we want, uh, we want something to be fixed, we want it quick. But we know that this process takes time, but it's, uh, we believe that it's a long-term, uh, it, will, it will be a long-term uh, effect into, 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 into their leaderships. So, Magali, yes. Magali, mm -hmm. um, I think we need to hear from Fernando next. Okay, thank so you. So that we can move along, so we can get all four of you in. Okay. So uh, we've been listening to you all day. I know you have so many things to share, but um, with respect. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. So Magali um, and Fernando work together. So thank you very much, Magali. Like I say, we could listen a long time. Let me tell you a little about Fernando. Here's some highlights of Fernando. Born in Mexico. Fernando immigrated at age five to join his parents. He witnessed many injustices, such as immigration raids, discrimination, in a small rural Missouri town that he grew up in. And all of this fueled your passion, Fernando, his passion for student, community, and labor organizing efforts. I would like you to know he was founding member of the first Arkansas Young Immigrants Organization. He has worked tirelessly for 10 years and he now, you continue your work through the Northwest Arkansas Workers Justice Center. So Fernando, let us hear from you about your work and life. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an organizer with the Northwest Arkansas Workers Justice Center. Um, so uh, it has been interesting uh, this year. Uh, we've uh, uh, because of the political climate that we're uh, living in with uh, um, where the president's making it okay to be a white supremacist uh, publicly. Um, so we've, uh, that has been uh, uh, affected how we do our work. So we've uh, had to do uh, uh, some changes in, in our, in our work as well. Um, and one of the additions that, uh, that we added to our work was um, uh, seeing how uh, the community can, uh, defend themselves, how the community can uh, look out for each other um, as well. Because uh, we're seeing that law enforcement, local law enforcement, uh, the immigrant community can't really trust in local law enforcement, uh, especially when there are local agreements like uh, the 287G. And uh, for folks who are not uh, familiar with that agreement, it's an agreement between local law enforcement and uh, federal uh, immigration agents. Uh, uh, so uh, they can act as immigration agents. So basically it's, uh, it's an attack on the community. Um, uh, from immigration. So um, the immigrant can be, as I was saying, right, the immigrant community can't really trust um, going to uh, law enforcement uh, for some issues. So there we're starting to develop uh, uh, barrio committees, as we're calling them, or neighborhood committees, uh, where the immigrant community is looking out for each other um, as well on immigrant issues as well. But not just that, but also other issues that might, they might be seeing in the neighborhood um, as well. Um, and this also has a connection to uh, to labor organizing uh, as well, because it, you can't really separate immigrant rights from workers' rights, uh, because the vast majority of immigrants uh, we come here to work, right? Um, or we came here because our parents were seeking uh, work, and now we're working as well. Uh, so it's it's the same struggle, right? The immigration uh, rights movement and the workers' rights. Uh, uh, movement. So there's always that that connection. Um, so we're uh, starting to to uh, empower the community, uh, so the community doesn't have to depend on the state, which is currently uh, oppressing us right now as the immigrant community. Um, so we're uh, looking for forms to empower the community um, uh, as well. And all of that has to do with workshops as well. As Magali was stating, popular education has been key uh, to be able to 
empower folks. And if uh, what popular education is, is an alternative to the uh, traditional model of education that we see in schools where um, it's the teacher who's giving all the information to the students and the students are just absorbing everything. Um, and this is an alternative where we're all teachers and we're all students. We all learn from our experiences and we can all teach uh, uh, folks on our experiences as well. So it's, it's more of a, a mutual, uh, uh, the education goes both ways, right? Uh, everybody's a student, everybody's a teacher um, as well. Um, and uh, we have to be able to find uh, how to use these models to empower folks as well, because some of the immigrant community, uh, some might have not even had the opportunity to go to school uh, back home um, as well. So we, uh, we got to figure out a way to uh, work with, uh, uh, with uh, communities who might not be completely literate. So popular education is uh, um, a model that goes a long way uh, with uh, working with uh, uh, communities who haven't had the same opportunities as, as other communities um, as well. Uh, so that's something that we're uh, working towards as well. Um, and we've also um, been, and, and in our trainings as well, we've been moving away from setting up a room uh, with chairs facing a screen and just doing PowerPoints, right? But we're uh, uh, getting people moving and uh, talking to each other and learning from each other um, in, in our meetings and our trainings as well. Uh, so we've been trying to move away from just the PowerPoint uh, uh, model and, and it's, it's been uh, working out really, uh, really great as well. Um, and I think uh, something uh, to move forward on uh, as well um, to protect our rights is also to uh, think about what strategies we're going to be using as well to uh, uh, reach the goals that we're trying to reach. Um, I know there's a lot of emphasis on on, on voting, and uh, it's important, and I and I vote as often as I can, um, but. Really, the, a big chunk of the immigrant community uh, doesn't have the right uh, to vote um, as well. So that's leaving out a lot of people um, um, out of the, uh, if, if we're just talking about voting power, it, leave, it excludes a, whole, uh, a, a big chunk of our population. Uh, so there we're talking with our members as well that we also have power. Whether you have the right to vote or not, we all have power. And that's our labor power and that's our economic power um, as well. So I think moving forward for the immigrant rights uh, movement, we can't just depend on politicians um, because both parties have been, uh, have historically attacked the immigrant community. Uh, the immigrant community, uh, those who can vote, uh, overwhelmingly gave our vote uh, to, uh, to Obama, but then he responded with uh, close to 3 million deportations um, as well. So we can't really count on, on uh, any of these major parties to uh, be a voice for immigrants or stand up for immigrants right uh, when they come into power. Um, so we also have to look on how our community has power. And that's where we're talking about our labor power and our economic uh, power as well. Um, if we remember back uh, in 2006 when there uh, uh, was uh, the Sinsenbrenner anti-immigrant uh, uh, law, um, the immigrant community mobilized and on May 1st, 2006, there was a huge uh, uh, strike, uh, a day uh, without immigrants. Um, and that's the power that we have. Um, and I, I can uh, always guarantee you that if the immigrant community withdraw our economic support, withdraw our labor from the economy, then we're not going to have to go to talk to the politicians. The politicians are going to come and talk to us, asking us to go back to the stores, asking us to go back and work, asking because the immigrant community, that's our, our greatest power. And um, so that's what we're uh, working with, with our membership as well, is to empower them uh, uh, as well. And also training them to be uh, organizers as well. Um, I think the best organizers uh, come from the community, uh, whether it's community organizing or the best labor organizers come uh, from the shop floor um, as well, because they know the experience. They're the, they're the experts in, in their job. They're the experts in their community. So I think empowering them uh, to become community organizers, to become labor organizers, that's going to be uh, crucial as well. Um, because that's, that's really what we need to do is empower uh, uh, the grassroots um, as well. Um, cause we can't really have, uh, I know there, there are great organizations doing work out there, but we can't really, uh, have, I guess what they call grass tops, uh, uh, speaking for the grassroots when the grassroots can, uh, speak and organize, uh, on, on themselves as well. So that's what, uh, um, 
we're doing is having a more grassroots approach, empowering uh, and the base, empowering the workers, and, and empowering uh, uh, the community uh, to mobilize as well. Um, so we've been working with these uh, uh, comités de barrio, as Magali said, um, and um, we've been uh, uh, um, getting a, a, a lot of uh, interest from uh, folks in the community as well. Uh, just this weekend, we traveled to Missouri, and there was a, a, a great group that met with us, and they're interested in knowing more. They're interested in becoming organizers as well. Um, and a lot of that has to do as well because the immigrant community uh, is under attack, and it's not just the immigrant community as well. Um, in other communities, LGBTQ community, uh, the black community is currently under attack. And I think to move forward as well, it's also gonna be important to uh, build uh, 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 relationships with all the uh, movements with other oppressed people um, uh, as well. Because we're all uh, struggling for, for our rights, we're all struggling for our, our liberation and working together collectively with all these uh, groups of oppressed uh, folks coming together and working collectively, um, we're, uh, we're gonna uh, uh, beat the rights of white supremacy and we're gonna uh, fight back against uh, this government that um, is uh, uh, very anti-immigrant, uh, that's a, a racist uh, government. I mean, uh, 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 Trump just pardoned uh, uh, Sheriff Joe Arpaio who, did a lot of damage in the immigrant community in Maricopa County in Arizona. And so this is, this is the, the current government that we're having to face is uh, uh, openly supporting uh, white supremacists like uh, Joe Arpaio. Um, yeah, so I think uh, empowering the community uh, and, and providing those resources and guide the community in the organizing efforts, I think it's gonna go a long way, uh, especially in the times that that uh, we're uh, living in. And um, it is very unfortunate, right, that uh, um, uh, these corporations uh, that uh, benefit from immigrant labor are not really doing uh, enough to support uh, immigrants as well. Um, I, I've lobbied in the past and I've seen that uh, corporations like Walmart and Tyson lobbying against anti-immigrant laws uh, uh, because of course they will, because it's going to affect their labor force, right? They don't want to lose uh, uh, labor. They don't want to lose workers. Uh, um, but I don't see the same commitment in lobbying uh, for pro-immigrant uh, laws. Um, and I think that has to do as well with, uh, well, if, uh, if workers, if immigrant workers are going to uh, um, gonna get some uh, uh, status, um, uh, legal Im immigration status, then they're going to be demanding the rights. So I think that's where they're hesitant right there. But um, yeah, we can't count on, on, on either politicians or executives to, uh, to stand up for us. Uh, the people have to organize. And I think that that's going to be our role as organizers moving forward is to empower the people to mobilize and uh, uh, protect their communities and to protect their, their rights. Wow. Thank you so much, Fernando. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will hear from Blanca Estevez. Let me tell you a little bit about Blanca. She is an activist, student, and healthcare professional. And Blanca has been involved in immigration policy reform all of her life, her young life. <laughs> uh, a political refugee from El Salvador, she came to the United States amid conflict in her home country. She came at an early age, attended um, school in Northwest Arkansas, and she has now become focused her efforts, of which are many. She will discuss today her work as immigration chair of Ozark Indivisible. Uh, this Ozark Indivisible is prominent in Northwest Arkansas in many ways and is a part of a national movement that formed in opposition to the Trump administration. This is grand roots, grassroots <laughs> at, at its premium. Blanca? Hi, thanks for having me. Um, before we start, let me read a little bit about who we are um, as Ozark Indivisible. Um, we're a grassroots movement of activist patriots living in Northwest Arkansas who focus on blocking any national level legislation that would threaten rights of individuals under the Trump administration. 
And because our group is entirely grassroots, we operate solely on a volunteer basis. No money is being paid to any of our members or organizers for any event that they participate in or any action that they go to. So we literally have a shoebox that holds the money that we have to operate with. So a shoe, a literal shoe box. So we don't have any money. And um, to talk about the same things that Magali and Fernando said, in the immigration group, we're very, very particular about if we're going to start collecting money or raising money for anything, we really want to know where it's coming from. Because like they said, the big companies, Tyson and Walmart, work against immigrants as they've already explained. So one of our biggest hurdles that we have is that we do all of the issues. Ozark Indivisible members are, we, we do all of the issues, healthcare, environment, everything. And the Trump administration currently is attacking from all sides and they're dividing and conquering to just, to take us down. So we focus on an issue at a time and we were able to stop healthcare or at least delay it. We're hoping to do the same thing with any anti-immigration bills that he has or that Congress has to pass. Our Most of our efforts right now are on DACA in Arkansas as our Attorney General wants it gone um, and the RAISE Act that Senator Cotton is sponsoring with Senator Perdue. We actually have a protest on Sunday, this Sunday, from one to three in front of his office. So we're always in, we're, what we try to do is just bring attention to everything. And most of our, most of our members are brand new to this. They didn't realize that most of these things were happening under Obama. They didn't realize that 287G came from Bill Clinton's administration. Most we're, so what we're doing is teaching the community and, and even, I, I can't, I don't know how to articulate, but we're even, we're going out of our comfort zones to teach the community members. So we're educating ourselves in order to educate others. And then we're having, we're just having large amounts of people come out to support us in town halls and actions, protests. So we're doing a lot of work. It, the, the main struggles are just keeping people in a sense of just continuing and everybody's getting burnt out by everything that they see on the news. So the biggest issue right now would be with the amount of things that we're seeing from the administration and trying to keep people positive and trying to give them something to something to work towards when it seems like all hope is lost. So we collaborate with Workers Justice Center because their ideals align with ours for things like the May Day strike that that you were part of, Patty. And we're trying to or we're trying to collaborate with others as well where our ideals meet so that we can then expand on to actual the actual people that are being affected by it so ideally i would like to see an immigrant that's living the life right now take over my position and we could fall under his or her leadership on what to do so i i think that's it i don't really know what else to say thank you thank you mm -hmm. thank you thank you We'll check in with you maybe during question and answer too. So thanks okay. for that, that overview of a grassroots movement in the biggest, greatest, deepest sense of the word. Now we're going to hear from Maria Grace. And you see, um, this woman, let me tell you a little bit about her. Um, she will share the actions of actually a charter for compassion part the organization called Arkansas United Community Coalition. This is an immigrants rights nonprofit organization with a mission to empower Arkansas immigrants. And this is not just Northwest, this is all over Arkansas. And they do this through, uh, you'll hear more about it, but leadership development, organizing, advocacy, 
promotion of civic participation, and immigration service navigation, which is a really important aspect of their work. I'd like you to know that uh, Mariah serves as chair of the Arkansas State Board of Education after being the first Latina to be appointed by the governor. She has also received many awards after returning to Arkansas where she spent her young years following her international service. So, hello and thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. Can, can you hear me all right, Patty? Yes, I think so, yes. Perfect, wonderful. I'm, I'm have my iPhone next to me. I couldn't quite get uh, everything to work on my computer this morning. My apologies, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, I just missed the millennial generation and not as good with uh, technology as I'd like to be. Um, <laughs> well, I think there's a hard part of being uh, the caboose to a lot of great speakers already. And we have, um, and I personally have a lot of deep respect uh, for the organizing work of the Workers' Justice Center and Ozark Indivisible. Um, and, and so I think where I'm going to focus my conversation, or at least my contributions, is a little bit more about us at, at Arkansas United um, and, and the specific work we're doing. Um, but if you'll permit me, Patty, I'll get into a little bit more de uh, details on the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals campaign um, that we're working on right now and is um, what is uh, at least urgently um, uh, for I think all of us that are on the phone and otherwise um, uh, toward the top of that list with priorities um, because of uh, imminent action that we're expecting any day, um, either this week or next week and in its regard. And it'll have a deep, deep uh, repercussions for about 8,000 dreamers here in Arkansas. Um, and we sure would appreciate the support and help of anyone on this call uh, who would like to offer assistance and, and be involved in this time. Um, so just a little bit on, on Arkansas United. Um, it's really hard for me to talk about Arkansas United and not uh, talk a little bit about um, my own personal story as well um, as a Mexican-American growing up here in Arkansas. Um, I have to say my, my family's arrival to Arkansas very much preceded um, the huge growth that we saw, just as Magali said, uh, back in 1992 when Tyson's Chicken very intentionally uh, sent down um, buses into Mexico and started what we saw as this huge explosion. My family came here before that. Um, and um, I know as a child here, um, being different uh, was extremely difficult. Um, to the point in my school, no one had ever heard of an English language learner. The best they could interpret with my accent uh, was that I had a handicap. And instead of getting to learn how to read and write with the rest of my classmates, I got sent to the back of a trailer um, where I got hit with a ruler every single time I mispronounced a word. And sometimes when the system treats you differently, um, kids follow suit. And I literally don't have a single memory of growing up in Arkansas uh, that doesn't include bullying. Um, and my nickname throughout school was Mexican Monkey uh, because as I came to learn, uh, my classmates and their parents uh, thought that um, Mexicans were equivalent to animals. Um, but uh, my, my passion from organizing, um, my passion for diversity um, definitely derived um, in those early years. Um, it was more around the compassion that I was shown uh, by uh, my teachers and by my parents uh, who believed that uh, the way that we were going to show that diversity brings value through Arkansas was through educational achievement um, and proving that the American dream was just as accessible to us as it was to everybody else. Um, and then my passion for organizing actually came from my family um, back in Mexico, um, who I'm very proud that I have an aunt uh, who was the first woman mayor of our town in Mexico and the first um, openly lesbian mayor of our town um, in Mexico. And really really proved um, to me, challenged me to look at our political leaders, um, just as I know um, the previous speakers have talked about, but also to acknowledge the lack of diversity that we have in our leaders and the reality that it, it's really hard pressed in any country in any democracy to find uh, individuals who are in decision-making positions that look like the people um, that they are representing. And we need to change that. And that was what started my journey in, in political organizing at the international level was trying to fight for that space for youth, um, indigenous communities, women to have voices in democracies, not realizing that back here in home things had changed in the years I was away. And uh, my dad got sick um, here in Fayetteville. I didn't think about it twice. I was supposed to be in Afghanistan starting women candidate school um, when um, I got the news that my dad had terminal cancer. And I couldn't be halfway around the world um, at that time. And, um, and I still remember to this day landing in the airport in Fayetteville. It's been several years since I've been back. And I was greeted in Spanish in the airport. 
And, um, and I asked the person, I was like, am I in Fayetteville, Arkansas? Is this right? Did I land in the right place? Um, and it didn't take long to find that Arkansas had changed significantly. And we are now, um, at least based on the last two census, the fourth fastest growing immigrant population in the country. Um, and so in getting involved at that time, I landed back in Arkansas at two really key moments, um, at least that uh, helped determine the work that we do at Arkansas United. Um, one was in the fight uh, at the national level for the DREAM Act, um, the last real time where we had the opportunity to correct the wrongs um, that we've done to dreamers. And dreamers are individuals, um, youth, um, who grew up in this country, um, have uh, not had any uh, issues with the law, are, are students or, or, or working, trying to improve themselves. And at that time in 2010, there was bipartisan support uh, to talk about a pathway to citizenship for our dreamers. And, um, and unfortunately, um, and this was tied to the other issue that was at that time in 2010, it was the first time uh, that there was conversations around the Latino vote in Arkansas and what could that potential look like and what would it look like um, to actually um, be able to um, talk about it, a constituency based voters that were bigger in numbers um, and more diverse, um, like uh, especially up here in Northwest Arkansas at that time. And, um, and a lot of Latinos were encouraged to come out and vote based on the belief um, there was one senator, especially Senator Blanche Lincoln, who was up for reelection. And out of the belief that she was going to support the DREAM Act. Um, and it completely shocked us. Two weeks before Election Day, uh, there was a vote on the DREAM Act. And here we were rallying. And many in dreamers, dreamers or people that supported dreamers were the ones that were getting involved and trying to turn out this vote. And Senator Blanche Lincoln voted no. She voted no to the DREAM Act as did our Senator Mark Pryor. And when we asked Senator Blanche Lincoln, how was that possible, right? Here we are trying to rally the Latino vote, say that Arkansas is different, say that she's somebody that's gonna be here a leader for diversity. How could she possibly vote no? And she said, I'm sorry, Mireya, I feel like I'm going to lose more white votes than I'm going to gain in Latino votes by supporting the DREAM Act. And I can't do anything for you if I'm not in office. To which we responded with all due respect, Madam Senator, you're not doing anything for us in office. And I really didn't think at that time that we would continue to get dreamer engagement. I didn't think at that time that anyone would show up and continue to be involved. And I was shocked because we had a phone bank that night of that vote. And every single volunteer with whom I was working with, the ones that were our interns, the ones that were um, directly um, making a commitment on getting out the vote, they all showed up. And I asked, how is that possible? And they said, Mireya, I, we have no choice but to believe that we, if we keep at the system, if we keep engaging, our politicians will eventually do the right thing. And so it was that night, that moment, um, that definitely I know forged um, what I've been trying to do here in Arkansas, but what we at Arkansas United as well, um, which as many as others have said, a, a commitment to immigrant organizing and advocacy, a commitment to immigrant civic engagement, um, so that, so that um, Arkansas can become a place um, where our, our political systems don't keep failing our immigrants. Um, we can be a place where our politicians start looking like our communities and that we can all achieve a greater potential together. Um, so we um, are focused in terms of issue areas on immigration reform. That's been our, our big issue over the year, whether it's been the DREAM Act or the fight on comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we do um, uh, and consider ourselves community organizers in our base, um, and we are present and have organizers in over 17 communities across Arkansas. Um, we've graduated over 200 change agents, individuals who've taken a particular attention um, to wanting to learn our philosophy of story-based um, organizing and really building that um, and building teams um, into um, turning into strategy and trying to turn action and making a longer term commitment to systematic change in Arkansas. Um, but um, we have never stopped engaging the civic process. Um, as much as it's failed us, um, we have also been able to make some successes that we're very proud of. Um, we have doubled the Latino and Asian vote twice um, already here in Arkansas. And that's been by very strategically knocking doors, making phone calls, getting out that vote um, each and every election. Um, and, and then trying to as well um, create spaces for civic education, 
um, breaking down the barriers on how to use our ballot, um, but also um, breaking down barriers on interpretation, um, offering um, interpretation at the polls, um, as well as offering transportation, as well as offering voter protection, um, and working with attorneys every single election to make sure that every vote, um, regardless of someone's background, regardless of their language, gets counted. Um, and also in recent years, we started to run candidate schools, um, which is now our new majority movement, uh, where we're very intentionally trying to um, move um, uh, individuals, especially our black and brown um, members of our community, into leadership positions where they can build into a pipeline and have opportunity to be part of the system and change the system equally within as we do on the outside. Uh, but we also do have that commitment to advocacy and we're, we're proud to say that um, from the lessons we learned from Senator Blanche Lincoln, we stopped Senator Mark, Mark Pryor for two years um, with several wonderful partners um, as we tried to move the issue in comprehensive immigration reform. And where it seemed like Senator Blanche Lincoln was one of the votes that stood against the DREAM Act, in two years we were able to turn him into a yes vote on comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, immigration reform didn't move forward after that 2013 vote um, just because of uh, partisan politics and polarization, um, unfortunately, uh, in our Congress at that time. Uh, but we were able to offer that success to Arkansas, and that was one that immigrants themselves owned, um, and even our senator acknowledged, because it was by us building that relationship and working with him that mm -hmm. we were able to move him on the issue. Um, but other successes that we've been able to have, we're very proud, um, especially of our organizing base in Little Rock that sat on this legislative session this last year, and every single committee meeting is related to our anti-immigrant bills, because we did have anti-immigrant bills. Um, individuals that tried to take cue, just as um, the previous speakers had said to President Trump, um, they sat on those committees, were able to offer testimony and defeat um, the anti-immigrant legislation here in Arkansas. And the one bill that did pass, which was an anti-Sharia law bill that tried to scapegoat our Muslim community, and we were so proud that we worked with the Islamic centers, especially here in Jonesboro and in Northwest Arkansas and in Little Rock, uh, who were able to offer direct testimony and break down all the myths around um, the Sharia law and the intentions of this, which was really more about targeting Muslims. Uh, we were able to work with the ACLU to make sure that the version of the bill that did come out was unenforceable. Um, and so keeping Arkansas a state that hasn't passed directly anti-immigrant legislation. Um, and in the meantime, our immigrants are working and have now for three years in trying to create welcoming communities. And we're really proud that we've had 10 mayors who signed on to welcoming proclamations. This year, we're trying to put pressure on our governor as well as five other communities to be able to make claims um, about welcoming, more importantly, to follow that up with action. And this year, we're challenging them as mayors to also sign on to a Protect DACA petition, as well as Naturalize Now campaign, and doing their part uh, to support civic engagement and citizenship in their communities. Um, but one of the successes, I think, and that's where I'll end off with my comments here, um, because it ties into our last work, but also this moment that we're in, and that's with Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It's the dreamers themselves here in Arkansas in carrying a lot of different caps that can help celebrate um, the fact that we did finally get a success for our dreamers. It wasn't a full-on legislation with a pathway to citizenship, but Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DAFTA, that many of you all we hope have heard of, is an opportunity at a work permit and a driver's licenses uh, for our individuals, our dreamers, um, our undocumented youth that didn't have status but grew up in this country, and we're doing great things for our communities and our economy. And right now, that program, um, first, it was a challenge um, to make sure that um, uh, all the youth that could participate in the program did. Um, Arkansas has 8,000 youth, um, uh, 11,000 eligible, 8,000 um, who've been accepted in that program. And it was a really intentional effort um, because Arkansas is 50th in the country in attorneys per capita. It's harder to get an attorney here than anywhere else in the country. And amongst that, it's even harder with immigrants. We had members in the rural Arkansas being served and working in our organizing community that would have to travel five hours just to see an attorney, wait two months, travel five hours, and they were gonna pay at least $200 for a consultation fee without any commitment of assistance. And in that environment, how are we supposed to make sure that this opportunity was gonna be leveraged to its biggest benefit? And so we're proud that um, the Dreamers themselves and, and our communities organized to make sure that we develop partnerships. And we as AUCC did so with the Catholic Charities Immigration Services to make sure that Arkansas became one of the top states 
in being able to fulfill DACA applications and getting those approved. We were in the top 20th percentile in the country. We have fought for this opportunity. And now those students are working in our Arkansas economy. They're entrepreneurs. They're getting home loans. Um, they're getting um, um, the opportunity um, to be able to support um, uh, not just themselves, but their families and their whole communities. And now this program is under threat. Um, unfortunately, um, Trump um, had brought up this program and under his bigger umbrella, as he's done um, on, uh, throughout this time in attacks of Obama, trying to talk about presidential overreach. We were really afraid and had been organizing uh, in December that an executive order was gonna be imminent after he took office. Um, but then President Trump stopped the work um, and uh, a couple days after um, his uh, inauguration said that he was gonna let Congress take action on the Dreamers, that he was not gonna take action on DACA that he was gonna let um, our Congress take action. Um, and then just as Blanca had mentioned, um, unfortunately the Attorney General um, decided to take action um, outside of President Trump. Uh, deferred action for parental accountability, DAPA, it was gonna be an opportunity for parents of citizen children to also have a pathway. That was defeated, um, actually more better said, tabled by the Supreme Court last year. And uh, Department of Homeland Security back in June decided to just go ahead and close that program um, and not let a legal pathway in terms of pursuing what, what could be the options. A lot of that was the decision and now the, the makeup of the Supreme Court and decisions that politically it was probably not going to pass um, even out of the Supreme Court just because of the lineup. Um, unfortunately, 10 attorney generals decided to use that limelight in that moment to also call on for the close of deferred action for childhood arrivals. And our attorney general was one of those, was one of those. Um, we also think part of the political moment was because of the pushback that many dreamers themselves were part of in Texas. Um, Texas is fighting a show me your papers law and they shut down the state legislature with their organizing. And so we're not surprised that it's um, the very racist governor of Texas and then uh, racist individuals like our attorney general that joined in into that lawsuit. And so since that came out, we've been um, running um, with uh, several other partners, accountability campaigns um, on our attorney general. But now as we get closer to the deadline and rumors are coming at all angles, um, it does seem that some sort of imminent decision is to happen because the attorney generals have said they will take legal action on September 5th which is just in a little over a week, if Trump does not do something in that program. And so there's opportunities, and if anyone on this call is interested, um, you can sign on if you have an affiliation and say that you are a partner, you stand with staff and our dreamers. Um, we are also in the final stretch of demands for meetings with our attorney general and governor to actually face our dreamers and to try and hold them accountable and take Arkansas out of this lawsuit and legal action. And we are going to be um, hosting actions and hunger strikes um, starting on Friday of this week if our demands aren't met at a meeting with the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival beneficiaries. And then um, next week, um, we'll be sending hunger strikers to Washington, D.C. Um, and we will be, um, uh, uh, depending on what the decision is that comes down, um, although most scenarios are gonna end up in a bad result, we regret, um, uh, not to say that there's not hope, um, but there's very few scenarios here politically where something bad will not happen to our dreamers. Um, so we are expecting just as with conversations about trying to organize um, at a state and national level, walkouts, um, protests, actions, possibly even civil disobedience um, to take a stand for our dreamers. Um, these are our children. Um, that is what um, uh, I know even with myself personally um, inspired the, this journey. People as a, as a kid tried to tell me I was not a, a child of Arkansas, but I am an Arkansan and, and a proud Arkansan as are our dreamers. They are proud Americans. And I think we have an opportunity to all stand in here together and welcome the, the chance to answer any questions about DACA, but definitely do a call to action to everyone on this call. We need all the help we can get. Um, we know that it's going to be a long road ahead on immigration reform at the very least right now in this moment. Let's not let our children be victims um, to um, a polarized and political environment. And we cannot make political gain um, on the backs of our children. Thank you, Patty. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Well, now we have time for uh, question and answer. And I have uh, in my hand several. But let me say, first of all, that one participant wrote this. Thank you to all four of you for growing hope, 
with your compassionate actions, amazing information. And uh, you address this, so I have about four questions that we can pose, so I'll kind of try to move us along. But this one uh, is based on this comment I just read to you. What can compassionate advocates do to assist you? Now, Maria, you told us some of what you see. Fernando, Blanca, Magali, Dolly. Um, I think uh, for I think for white allies, uh, white allies of, of the immigrant community, I think it's going to be crucial uh, to go and, and organize as well in, in areas that overwhelmingly voted for Trump. Because um, I think it's going to be important to talk uh, to these folks who voted for Trump who might not necessarily uh, be as racist uh, as the president. Um, but I think it's going to be crucial for uh, to go into those communities and talk to these folks about why um, it's important to support the immigrant community, to uh, get them away from the ear of the white supremacists, because white supremacists are out there organizing as well. Um, as we've seen, they've had lots of rallies, uh, uh, many of these white supremacists bringing violence to these uh, rallies, but it's going to be key. Um, uh, to reach out to these uh, uh, communities, especially in rural uh, communities, to talk about why uh, uh, we should denounce racism, we should denounce fascism, and uh, we should uh, organize to stop the growth uh, of, of racism and fascism that we're seeing in, in the U.S. So I think that's going to be crucial, is for because uh, uh, it's it's not going to be as easy as uh, uh, somebody like me to go out in these communities, right, uh, where. Um, there are a lot of Trump supporters. I'd be pretty nervous <laughs> going in there. But I think that's where uh, um, uh, white allies can do is organize those communities against uh, uh, against Trump. Um, Thanks. And uh, uh, that's going to be crucial to, to stop the growth of white supremacy here um, as well. Um, because a lot of these communities are working class communities as well. And all of these communities are being, are going to be, uh, uh, negatively affected by uh, the corporate mentality that that Trump brings to to uh, to the White House um, as well. So that's going to be crucial: is go out to these communities uh, and organize uh, those communities against racism and fascism as well. Um, and I think uh, it's also going to be crucial for for allies and documented immigrants as well uh, uh, to step up and take more direct actions in case there are deportations um, uh, yeah. as well. Uh, so it's going to be, uh, I think those two uh, key points are going to be crucial. So I don't know if uh, uh, anybody else would like to give an input on that. Yeah, um, I will. Yeah, I will. I think it's going to be important to, civil disobedience should always be used, especially when it comes to immigrant rights. As we saw in with the healthcare fight on Capitol Hill, um, Caitlin, one of our organizers, was arrested for participating in civil disobedience. You, you have to put your life and your body on the line for other people as an organizer. You cannot, we cannot continue to focus on politicians to save us because they're not. I mean, we have a, an abundance of examples of both, both sides, both politicians from both sides, not listening to us. So when it comes to our community, we're going to have to use our bodies and use, use the tools that we've been taught. Civil disobedience is going to be key if we're going to want to save as many dreamers as possible. It is, in in my opinion, I believe that DACA is going to end soon. And unfortunately, we're going to have to go out to the streets and protest and do whatever we can to call on everybody that has ever known a dreamer, has ever known or has had a student of theirs in class or has a friend that's an immigrant, just to call them out. And so we need to start stop focusing on the color of our skin and start focusing on classism because that's what's keeping us down. It's not, it's nothing else. It's, that's what's keeping us down. So I think if you are an advocate and an ally, those key things are going to be important. So when somebody calls out that they need help or something or start listening to them rather than us as leaders telling them what to do, we should 
hone our skills a little bit better and start listening to the majority of the people that are being affected by this rather than us going out telling people and shouting telling them what to do i mean there are teachers most of them are our elders so they have a lot to teach us and we can definitely move mountains with their assistance thank you Magali, do you have anything you want to add to this or shall we move on to another question? You'll have to, un there we go. Yeah. Magali? Uh, uh, I, I agree with they said we should, we should move on. I don't have any. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well then there is a question about, um, well, let me, let me explain the right to work concept. Um, not all of us on, this fernando can you explain the, the right to work state concept that is our yeah concept? yeah uh, right to work is uh is uh, basically an anti-union uh, uh law that it makes it harder to organize unions uh because if if, if you do organize a union in your workplace uh right to work means that um not everybody has to join the union but they get the same benefits uh so people uh, uh workers uh uh since they get the same uh benefits they're not going to join the, uh, the union if they don't uh, want to or if they don't have to um but they'll get the same benefits so it's a way to weaken uh, uh unions uh in in these states um and most of the southeast part of the country uh um has a uh, right to work laws uh, so it makes it uh even harder to organize unions as well um but um even though uh, there is the right to work, there still is the Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, uh, which guarantees uh, workers, uh, regardless of immigration status, guarantees the workers the right to organize. Um, and it basically says uh, if at least two uh, workers um, uh, meet, uh, discuss, and plan and take action to improve working conditions, then they're protected by federal law uh, from retaliation from their employers. It doesn't mean that it's not gonna happen. A lot of employers still take retaliation, uh, illegal retaliation uh, against workers, uh, but that's what right to work is. But, uh, but we still have other laws on, on, the, on the books that uh, uh, protect uh, organizing in most industries. Um, two industries that are not covered, uh, that don't have the right to organize uh, is agricultural work uh, and domestic work. Um, as well, and that the origins of, of excluding those sectors uh, goes back uh, to slavery and, and racism as well. Yeah. Well, then that takes us to another question, which says uh, the question is: Have have any of you, you had any success at working with the large corporations to create change? Um, well, at the end of April, uh, Tyson announced that they're going to start improving working conditions, uh, that they're going to start looking into some issues that workers are facing. Uh, but that, what really got them going on that was uh, action taken by workers uh, as well. Last year, there were two protests uh, targeting uh, Tyson. Uh, over the working conditions and over the restroom breaks, uh, as Magali mentioned earlier. Um, but through those actions, we, uh, uh, the Worker Center was able to publicly pressure uh, Tyson on that uh, as well. Um, and uh, the second report that Magali mentioned on the restroom break, uh, I think that that's what really pressured uh, uh, Tyson into taking action. Uh, because once uh, people found out that some workers even have to wear diapers on the job because they can't go to the restroom when they're on the processing line. And that, uh, I, it's, it surprised a lot of people that, that that's still going on uh, today. Uh, so that caught a lot of attention and, and the media picked it up like wildfire, not only local media, national media, but international media um, as well. Um, because there has been, in, in the nineties, there were, uh, um, programs that were implemented at, at corporations where they were going to start monitoring uh, the conditions, but that didn't work out uh, very well. Uh, so if we really want to prove in work conditions. I think uh, they have, uh, the committees and the movement and the organizing campaigns has to come out of the workers who are, are on the processing line um, uh, for it to have a bigger impact. 
so through these uh, uh, actions that were taken, uh, Tyson felt pressured into publicly announcing that they're going to uh, start improving working conditions, um, that they're going to hire floaters so people can actually use the restroom um, as well, that they're going to respect the right to organize and that they were going to allow uh, worker committees on the job. Uh, we're still skeptical on that because I had mentioned before that has been tried before in the 90s and it failed uh, and we're skeptical about it, but we're still going to uh, use uh, the message that they used, uh, that, uh, that they announced publicly that workers do have the right to organize, that they're going to allow worker committees and that they're going to uh, start improving working conditions. Um, and we, we are working with our base, with our, our uh, with the poultry workers committee in the, in the workers center uh, to make sure that they follow through uh, uh, on that in the plants, uh, that they're seeing the changes in the plants. Um, Thanks. I think, uh, the, the main issue of why they don't want to respect the, or they don't want to slow down the lines for people to use the restroom is because they want to squeeze out as much labor as possible from people. Uh, that way their profits are higher. Uh, so it, it's because of profits, I mean, just sitting down with the corporation and trying to negotiate and trying to convince them uh, to improve working conditions, it's not very likely that it's going to happen that way. Our workers have to organize and take action like they did last year to uh, pressure these people to, uh, to start making these changes that, that is greatly needed inside the processing plants. Thank you, Fernando. Well, so we, I mean, we had an overview of political, way to work politically, way to work with organizing and way to work demonstrations and grassroots. Um, one of the questions now, does anybody else want to add to that? But Fernando did, I don't want to cut. Uh, I can add. I can add something as well, Patty. Um, okay. I, I will say that um, I, I think with a lot of our advocacy strategies, as we put together kind of our our, our campaigns and our targets, um, we also have have worked to make Walmart and other key employers part of those targets as well. And um, and then to use the influence, just as um, Blanca had mentioned, that they have over our politicians, um, and especially um, the current politicians in our state leadership. Um, to um, to uh, use their influence um, on on issues as related to immigrants and and protecting um, uh, Arkansas as, as a welcoming place. Um, we we know that Walmart has invested a lot of money um, into creating what they're calling welcoming Northwest Arkansas, vis-a-vis um, -vis their their initiative Engage Northwest Arkansas, um, and it really for them is dependent on um, uh, whether it's nonprofits or the community in general, different groups. Group, um, to buy in and so knowing that that's their interest um, they are consistently part of our strategy and plans and so when we were fighting the anti-immigrant legislation in um, the legislature um, we challenged um, the Walmart um, executives um, and Tyson executives and lobbyists um, to uh, use their influence um, with folks in the legislature to help us defeat those bills, uh, just like we are right now trying to get um, them as well to sign on as standing with DACA um, and, um, and making statements uh, not unsimilar to like they did out of Charlottesville, right? Um, and saying that uh, President Trump was wrong there, um, that he similarly used their influence um, and their public relations power to make statements in favor of immigrants. Um, there's no um, uh, exchange or conditions. They, they themselves have decided they want to um, uh, be seen as uh, more welcoming to diverse groups and, um, and they acknowledge the diversity of their consumer base. Um, these are purely um, conversations and open dialogues that we've had. I don't think it's, you can define work with corporations as success for all the reasons that Magali and Fernando um, stated, um, there's so much work to be done and, and corporations just by their for-profit nature are flawed. Um, and it's actually one of our biggest challenges, I think even in communication is um, they don't have a lot of respect for the nonprofit or public sector because they only understand the world in the terms of making profit. Um, but um, knowing what their interests are, just like we do with politicians, um, we work very hard to hold them accountable um, and, and, and insist them and demand that they use their influence. Um, and uh, and again, I, I don't know if I can say that's an outcome, but that they, they remain a target for us, our organizing. Um, and, and we know that in our, uh, with our membership, really want to see that kind of leadership from their employers, right? Um, like right now with the documented employers, we're working with documented folks to get their employers to make statements as well. 
um, but they're benefiting, right? I mean, it's one of the, the fallacies with immigration reform. We put all the blame on the immigrants, but the reality is we wouldn't have the broken system we have if it wasn't for corporations, companies, employers, right, um, who are benefiting from immigrant labor um, and, 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 and the broken system that we have. Um, that, and so it's important that there's a level of accountability with, with employers and corporations as well. Wow, thank you. And I just wanted to add something else on the corporation issue about working with these corporations. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to approach these corporations, especially if they have, uh, uh, if they benefit from the detention of immigrants and the deportations of, of immigrants as well. Uh, we've uh, recently been uh, talking with Movimiento Cosecha, which, which is a national uh, um, organization, national campaign, right, to empower uh, the grassroots, to empower immigrant people. Um, and we've been talking with them, and uh, there is a campaign to launch a boycott against Walmart because they benefit from uh, the detention and deportation of immigrants as well. So it's hard to approach these corporations when they're, uh, uh, through their investments, are attacking uh, our community uh, as well. So we got to be careful as well who we approach and how, uh, I, if, if, if they truly want to help the immigrant community and they truly want uh, diversity, uh, as they say, they, they need to divest from uh, these private uh, prisons, these uh, um, divest uh, uh, from these private companies that are making money off the deportation of our people. Yeah. Well, so this leads us then to maybe this may be our last question, and I'm going to direct this first to, to Magali. Um, have the, the, you all, is Magali there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, have the the groups that you represent you all find yourselves being able to work together in any kind of uh, collaborative way or do you see right now that it's important to maintain your own independence and work at the piece of the puzzle from your perspective some of that is, so i'm, I'm going to start with magali and then Maybe we'll have time for the others of you to chime in on that. <laughs> so I want to clarify the question is that if we want to seek uh, alliance with other organizations or if we want to stay uh, as we've been working, is that? Well, I think the, this question was, do your groups work together? The Workers' Justice Center, the AACU, and the indivisible. That's one aspect of the question. Mm -hmm. Then the other is, what about other groups, perhaps? That's another dimension that you could address. Yeah, uh, well, as Blanca was saying in, in the, at the beginning, we were working with them, collaborating with the May, they March, uh, and as well with the AUCC in the past. Um, we have different approaches and how we organize and how and how we perceive organizing and and all of them are very important and good for the community uh, however now we are focusing a lot of growing the the base and empower the base so we are definitely not um uh, we want, I mean, we want to work with all these people together and, and, and all of that. But as I said, we are focusing now on growing the base, on, on growing the, 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 the base of workers. Um, but I mean, I don't know, I, maybe in the future we want, to, I mean, now we also collaborate a lot with an organization that does uh, theater for justice because uh, I believe, I strongly believe that art can change people's mind and can grow conscious. So we are, tr we are starting to incorporate more art into our work because as I say, I am an artist and, uh, and I believe that uh, will, that will make a very powerful movement. And so we're working with them and stretching our collaborations with them. And, and this year we have another action that we probably will have uh, we'll we'll be reaching out to other folks. Thank you. Anybody else? Blanca. Sure. Um, well, as you know, or maybe most don't know, but Ozark Invisible is open to anybody that wants to join. Um, each committee is ran by a chair, and the chair decides who they want to collaborate with and who they don't want to collaborate with for whatever reasons. Maybe our ideals don't line up. 
but um, we're always we're always in the fight. We're always in the same struggle. We just have different approaches to things, and um, but eventually we're all going to have to come together to serve the community. Yeah, the so. work in progress, right? Yes. <laughs> Mariah, anything? No, definitely. Well, um, even from my, within our name, Arkansas United Community Coalition, right? Co coalitions and working with others is, is a huge part of, of who we are. And it's one of the first things we do in working with a community is to create a stakeholders map, right? Of who else in the community and who we might engage in different ways. And it just looks different based on the individual communities and the organizers that we have. Um, but we um, always strive to work in partnership um, with those that, as I think the others have said, have shared values and interests, points of interest. I think where I've seen Arkansas do best, because this question keeps coming up, um, and I know even beyond the immigrant circle, um, are there ways where we can unite and be a united front, right? And I've even seen new groups merge with, with those goals of trying to bring folks together and around the table. And there's always going to be challenges. And I think that's what you've heard um, listed in this conversation. We all have a deep respect for each other. And I think doing this work, you come to realize there's so much work to go around. Um, it's good that there's new actors and there's there's people constantly wanting to get involved and find ways to get involved. Um, and, and we never, and, and none of us, you know, we sometimes you have to train yourself, but it's, it's not a threat, it's welcome. Um, but um, there are different opportunities. Um, uh, where we can explore niches, definitely needs that aren't being filled. Sometimes needs are being filled and then moving people into those directions and trying to connect the dots. Um, we realize that we may not all agree on everything, um, but um, every single time I've seen a crisis moment or a crisis issue, at least as we've done as immigrants, but um, even when I was looking at the great work, you know, that Ozark Indivisible did with the Affordable Care Act, and around broader based issues, our Kansans do have the ability to come together around shared interests. And I think that's the key is like when there's um, a common issue, I think we, um, whatever um, other other elements of our work and things, we, we, we the priority emerges and we put efforts uh, toward working together. And I think we do that better in this state than anywhere else um, that I've seen. Um, and, and it's not for shared interest. I think we are all just trying to do the best we can to serve our communities in the best ways. Um, um, but I, I think our Kansans um, and Northwest Arkansans do a good job when, um, when there's those shared interests. And so I'm, I'm definitely hopeful for a head and um, and what that that work looks like well you know miraculously we addressed each of the questions that we had um i do want to point out to those of you that are on the call that recently there was a uh, meeting with the county sheriff in regard to um and 50 constituents showed up and i think probably each of your organizations were represented in that because our uh the sheriff washington county sheriff has signed up for the uh, uh, isis act you all could say more about it and he has voluntarily agreed to notify immigration right immigration if someone is arrested the, pro, the constituents showed up to say, please do not do that. That is creating great fear in the immigrant community. I have a sense that you all came to that meeting to represent the constituencies. I don't know for sure. We don't have time to really go into that, but there are ways that you can come, to, can come together. So, now we come to the end of this marvelous <laughs> sharing of commitment and passion and uh, the use of each of your individual skills and your organizations is truly 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 to be commended you're making a contribution to our area to our country and to our world and we thank you so much for being a part of this conversation to all the rest of you here, I just want to say thank you for signing up for this. This has been recorded, so you can access the recording and you can share it with others. Um, then go to the charterforcompassion.org webpage. And of course, a lot of you that are participants here have already been there. Probably that's how you signed up. 
but I just want to say where to from here regarding the charter. First of all, you can engage with us further, and that includes uh, the participants uh, by affirming the Charter for Compassion, which you will see when you go to charterforcompassion.org. The other thing is you can become a partner individually or as an organization to the social justice sector. Uh, and there are other sectors too, like a women and girls and things like that. I mentioned that uh, Mariah's uh, organization is already a chart partner, but now you can go to the ex uh, next step to the social justice sector and sign up. So Ozark Indivisible could sign up and the Workers Justice Center. It's pretty easy. Just go to the web page, click on the link to partners, and it will show you how to do that. Uh, we also welcome donations. We get to the financial aspect. So if, when you go to the site, you will also see that there is a donate button there. So we invite you to consider that. And the last thing I want to say is that we will have another, at least one more webinar in September. And you can check uh, at the charterforcompassion.org and um, sign up for that particular one. Um, and you can find out more about it. So once again, deep, deep appreciation to all four of you and to all of our participants for engaging in such a meaningful deep conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>